It's a, it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, session on professionalism. We're, we're honored that Dr. Jordan Cohn from George Washington University um, is able to join us. Um, Dr. Cohn and I uh, have known each other since uh, the early to mid-80s when um, Jordy was the uh, chair of medicine uh, at the Michael Reese Hospital and served as the co-chair of the Department of Medicine uh, here at the university. Um, it, it, those were the halcyon days of the um, University of Chicago uh, Michael Reese relationship and, and they, were, they, they were wonderful days indeed. Um, Dr. Cohn has served as president of all of the important medical organizations. Um, he's been chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine, chair of the Accreditation Council of uh, Graduate Medical Education, president of the Association of Program Directors in Internal Medicine, and for 10 years served as president of the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges. Um, he's spent his career in academics uh, as a professor and dean uh, of several medical schools. Um, his travels have taken him to Harvard, Brown, Tufts, SUNY, and uh, to our own Pritzker. Uh, currently, uh, Dr. Cohn is the um, emeritus uh, president of the AAMC. Uh, he serves as the chair of the Arnold Gold Foundation, um, which, as you know, uh, focuses on medical humanism um, and uh, has sponsored the white coat ceremony uh, for a very long time since 1993. Um, uh, his background uh, is in uh, internal medicine and nephrology and um, I am delighted that today Dr. Cohen is going to talk about industry funding of medical education. Can we put the genie back in the bottle? Jordy, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mark. It's, it's always a terrific pleasure to come back to the University of Chicago to, uh, to see so many old friends and to see so many new friends, too. I'm really delighted to see so many. I assume these younger people in the audience are students, at least some of them are, right? Or maybe you're junior faculty by now. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it's great to see so many of you here. And, uh, uh, have a chance to uh, uh, pay my respects to Mark and, and to the McLean Center and to also congratulate Mark and all of you for this wonderful gift from the Buxbaum uh, family for this incredibly uh, important new initiative that is going to focus, I think, much needed energy and, and focus and attention on, uh, on uh, professionalism and on how to really maintain uh, the values that we have uh, inherited from our, from our forebears. And I'm going to be talking about at least one rather in some sense, small aspect, but I think indicative of some of the challenges that we're facing in contemporary medicine today, and that's uh, the way industry has, over the past several decades, uh, managed to make itself extremely, uh, uh, in, I would say, intrusive, uh, just to give you my bottom line on the topic, but certainly very impactful in terms of its influence on medical education. And what I want to talk about are, are three aspects of the way industry does involve itself in medical education. One is with, obviously, the funding of accredited continuing medical education programs in the country, and then the direct interaction that industry has with practicing physicians as well as those uh, in academia. And I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the interactions that industry has developed with academic medical centers in their educational mission. Well, beginning with the funding of, of, of CME, it's an incredibly uh, a lucrative activity. Over two billion dollars a year is spent on continuing medical education in this country and at least half, and I'll show you some data to support that, comes directly from industry, just direct subvention of continuing education programs from pharmaceutical industry mostly, but increasingly from device industries as well. There's another percentage. It's hard to get a, a, a handle around the exact number, and I really don't know what its magnitude is, but clearly it seems to be growing, and that is the support that industry provides through the so-called MECs, the medical education uh, and communication companies. These are either for-profit or often not-for-profit organizations that take money from the pharmaceutical industry, 
launder it would be my word, and then pass it through the to the continuing education sponsors uh, to support education in that way, so that the the uh, fingerprints of the industry are not directly traceable uh, on those on those dollars. Well, here's a, uh, some data showing you the the very rapid increase in the extent to which the industry, pharmaceutical industry particularly, supports CME. In 1998, the total CME support was less than a billion dollars, and again, half of it roughly from industry. But over the course of the subsequent nine years or so, um, the industry managed to increase its uh, activity, and the total, of course, exceeded now well over $2 billion, as I mentioned. I'll show you some other data shortly about the, 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 the timeline. So there's been a rapid expansion of industry support and of CME in general, and I think the increase in the CME is probably um, traceable to the complexity, increased complexity, increased need that physicians feel to maintain their, their skills as, uh, as medicine has gotten more and more uh, complex. Well, uh, the industry, as at least represented by the vice president for uh, 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 pharma, which is, the, as you know, the major national umbrella organization for the pharmaceutical industry, does much of the advocacy, lobbying uh, in Washington, as well as a lot of other activities in, su in support of the pharmaceutical industry. What Ken Johnson, the senior vice president, said just a, a little over a year ago, he says there is no evidence that a company's funding of CME or other physician educational activities, caveat, when provided within appropriate guidelines, <laughs> creates bias. Well, I, I'm just astounded at that statement, given what I'll show you momentarily, the evidence that is overwhelming that, uh, that, indus that, that uh, CME, particularly industry-supported CME, does have an influence on physicians' uh, behavior, particularly their prescribing behavior. Well, what about physicians? What are their attitudes about yeah, uh, 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 industry support for CME? Well, in a study just uh, earlier this year, uh, it was found in a, in a survey that 88% of practicing physicians believe that industry support of CME does introduce bias. So they're cognizant of, the, of that fact, yet less than half report a willingness to support their own continuing education. And I'll show you some more data about that as well. This is, a, again, an astounding, uh, I think, indictment of the way we think about these issues. We're, we're mindful of the bias, but unwilling to eliminate it by supporting our own CME, as it were. Well, the Senate Finance Committee, as you may know, has gotten into this act because of all of the visibility that industry support of uh, education and of research as well, which I'm not going to be talking about. But uh, Senator Grassley in the Senate Finance Committee is quoted as saying, it seems unlikely that this sophisticated industry would spend such large sums on an enterprise, but for the expectation that the expenditures will be recouped by increased sales. And again, I think it's, it's I believe it's axiomatic uh, to uh, conclude that industry that is committed to uh, its shareholders' interest is going to pursue interests that are profitable and not those that are not. So this is, I think, a, a, an obvious statement. Well, there is a Council for uh, Ethical and Judicial Affairs at the AMA, which has for many, many years been a very strong voice for uh, ethical principles, ethical values within, within the medical profession. It is a committee of the AMA. It doesn't speak directly for the AMA, and its recommendations need to go through the AMA's, AMA's apparatus. But now for several years, uh, including the current year, they have concluded that individual physicians, medical schools, teaching hospitals, and professional organizations must not accept industry funding to support professional education activities. Pretty straightforward statement. Medical schools and teaching hospitals must limit, again, caveat, to the greatest extent possible, industry marketing and promotional activities on their campuses. Well, these are pretty, I think, strong uh, uh, guidelines coming from this organization, but the fact is that these recommendations have been repeatedly rejected by the House of Delegates of the AMA, so they are not official AMA policy, but they represent simply the views of this uh, subset of the AMA. Well, the Macy Foundation had a conference in, in 2008 
uh, on this topic and came up with the following recommendations. Accredited organizations that provide CMA should not accept commercial support from pharmaceutical or medical device companies, whether such support is provided directly or, again, through these, these uh, MEC organizations. And secondly, that the financial resources to support CME should derive entirely from individual health professionals, their employers, including academic health centers, healthcare organizations, group practices, or other non-commercial uh, sources. In addition, the AAMC, I'm happy to say, and also in 2008, came up with a recommendation that all medical schools and teaching hospitals should adopt policies that prohibit the involvement of industry in continuing medical education activities. The AAMC in 2008 also weighed in and, and suggested or recommended that medical schools and teaching hospitals not accept any commercial support for uh, uh, educational activities. And finally, the, the, the IOM uh, in 2009, uh, and I'll come back to another recommendation from this group later, said a new system of funding accredited continuing education should be developed that is free of industry influence, enhances public trust in the integrity of the system, uh, and provides high-quality education. So these three organizations have essentially come to the same conclusion, namely that, that industry support of, medical ed of continuing education is something we ought to wean ourselves away from. Well, what has happened in that time since these recommendations came forward? Well, again, in, in keeping with the subtitle of this talk, putting the genie back in the bottle, the genie has maybe got a toe back in the bottle, but not, not much more, I would say. But the, the data that I showed you earlier were from 2006, which is just about at the apex of the total funding for continuing education in this country, and also the height of the industry support, which was close to a billion and a half dollars in direct. This is direct support, and this is advertising at CME activities, which is virtually uh, comes almost exclusively from from industry as well. So, but you can see since that time, the direct support from industry has, in fact, gone down quite substantially. Still, I think, in the neighborhood of a billion dollars uh, a year. So it's hardly uh, uh, decimal dust, but it's certainly an indication that at least there is some recognition on the part of industry that these activities are under greater scrutiny and are under uh, significant uh, criticism, and there may be some backing away from uh, these supports. But still, I would argue that, that the, oops, the involvement of um, industry in these activities is still quite substantial and I think, from my point of view, worrisome and needs to be monitored uh, closely. Well, let me move on then to, oh, I'm sorry, one other point about this. Do you guys know Howard Brody? Mark, are you familiar oh, yeah. with Howard? You must. He's the, he's the director of the Institute for Medical Humanities at the at University of Texas Medical Branch in, 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 in Galveston. And he, he quotes this, that the CME issue seems to me to strike at the very core of medicine's claim to be a profession and to adhere to a professional ethic. One of the defining characteristics of a profession is its own collective responsibility to assure the adequate education of its members. It's rapidly advancing field like medicine. This means that ongoing continuing education is a professional necessity. American physicians as a group are wealthy enough to pay for their own continuing education. I subscribe to that view, and I don't know that, I don't think it's a very widespread view yet in, in the profession because, as I'll show you, Shortly, many doctors believe that they are entitled to these kinds of subventions for their education, and that's an issue that I think uh, we need to recognize and I think in some ways address. Well, let me, let me turn then to the second major area where industry has a, an impact on the education of physicians, namely the way in which the industry interacts mostly with practitioners uh, who are uh, seeing patients uh, uh, in the real world, as it were. Well, the, the vast majority of the drugs, of, of drug industries, $28 billion of promotional activities is, in fact, directed at physicians. As you can see, uh, that the um, total expenditure uh, is $27.7 or $28 billion in 2004. The uh, support for journal professional advertising is down here at the bottom. 
the direct consumer advertising, which has been a huge issue and has raised a lot of questions about the, the appropriateness of the pharmaceutical industry going directly to the public with its uh, promotional activities, is, is a sizable but still a rather small investment con in comparison to the retail value of the drug samples that are given to physicians in their offices, in part as a way of gaining access to physicians' offices by bringing these samples to doctors, and also obviously as a way of introducing new medications, particularly to patients and, and in, in influencing the prescribing behavior of doctors in that way. And another seven plus billion dollars is spent on the individuals who do the detailing, the, uh, the, the drug reps, as it were, that, that uh, convey the drug samples and the, and the, and the promotional slash educational materials to, uh, to practicing physicians. Well, here's, a, here's a, 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 an article from the New York Times a few years ago that I thought sort of captured this in a way, that cheerleaders prep up drug sales was the, was the headline of this. Uh, As an ambitious college student and star cheerleader, Cassie Napier with all these, had all the right moves, flips, tumbles, and ever-flashing America's sweetheart smile to prepare for her job after graduation. She became a drug saleswoman. She now applies doctor's offices selling the antacid prevacid for tap pharmaceutical. Go on to quote, there's a saying that you'll never meet an ugly drug, drug rep. That's, I don't know who Thomas Carley is, but I think he's correct. I've never seen an ugly drug rep. But, uh, so this is, this is again, a, uh, uh, a common uh, form of, of, of involvement of the industry in the practicing physicians continuing education on a one-on-one -on -one basis or a few-on-one -on basis uh, directly in their offices. Now, how prevalent are interactions between physicians and industry? Again, some data from uh, a year ago by Eric Campbell, 84% of practicing physicians uh, in his survey report that they have some direct interaction with industry. Gifts, 71%. I'm surprised it's only 64% of them accept drug samples. I would have thought that might even been higher. 18% claim to have been supported for travel to, to meetings, and another 14% were directly involved in, quote, consultation with industry in one fashion or another. Well, here's a, sam here's a simple question I'd like to pose. This, you didn't know you were coming for a test, but this is a test, okay? Here's the question. Why does industry <laughs> give gifts to physicians? It's a, it's a multiple choice question. First possibility, in gratitude for all of the hard work that doctors do. It's a possibility, right? Or in the hope of curing favor for its products. Well, what would the man in the street give? What answer? I have to tell you that in the, the car that brought me here from the hotel this morning, I, the, the driver asked me what I was going to be talking about. I said, I'm going to be talking about industry support of medical education. He says, well, they must be wanting to get something back from that, don't they? <laughs> he was a man not in the street, but he was in the car, but it's the same, <laughs> same idea. <clears throat> Well, do, I mean, it's one thing for the industry to ply uh, physicians with gifts, but I think we still have to ask the question whether it makes any difference. I mean, if they just want to give gifts and it has no impact, uh, that would be nice. But do, do these gifts to physicians influence prescribing practices? Well, the answer is overwhelmingly yes. And that there have been multiple studies now that have uh, documented the fact that, that physicians, both in training as well as in practice, who are exposed to... Uh, uh, gifting and other activities of the of the industry do in fact change their prescribing but, uh, behavior as as a consequence of that. Here's a here's some of the evidence uh, from from some time ago, and I want to draw attention particularly to this uh, 2007 symposium where uh, some neurobiologists were convened to give an update about the kind of evidence that they were accumulating from their studies of uh, of both animals and humans about the way in which. Uh, reciprocity is elicited from uh, acts of, of, of from gifts and other uh, uh, such activities, and the influence uh, is really quite remarkable. Not just on behavior, but on the neurological correlates of those behaviors that one can pick up by neuroimaging and the like. So the the uh, fact that that it's not just a question of the big gifts, but even small gifts have have a, have a predictable uh, influence 
what social scientists have uh, shown, and this is a, a, an article from 2003, that when a gift or a gesture of any size is bestowed, it imposes on the recipient a sense of indebtedness. It's just the way we are hardwired as human beings. The obligation to directly reciprocate, whether or not the recipient is even conscious of it, tends to influence behavior. Feelings of obligation are not related to the size of the gift. So the notion that, in fact, the current, as far as I know, this has not been changed, but the current AMA guidelines on accepting gifts from industry is that a gift of less than $100 is permissible. Anything over than that is objectionable. But gifts of less than $100 is, is at least by their assessment, uh, uh, in keeping with professional behavior. I would question the uh, evidence to support that, uh, that, uh, that recommendation. Well, how do doctors rationalize their behavior? I mean, uh, this is not knowledge that's been kept under a rock. I mean, people know about these various things. What, what do doctors say in, in, in their attempt to uh, explain or, or to uh, rationalize their behavior? Well, the common thing is I am not influenced, but I know that other doctors are. And here are some data. This was a study by Steinman, who did a survey of doctors asking them, what do you think about yourself? Are you influenced by industry giving you gifts? 1% admitted, yeah, that influences me. Another roughly third said, well, a little bit. It influences me a little bit. But well over 60% said, not at all. I'm not influenced by this stuff. It doesn't bother me. I take the gifts, but I ignore it. I just do whatever I need to do. But my colleagues, mind you, <laughs> whoa, they are a different lot. A third of them are very heavily influenced by gifts. Another 50% a little influenced. 16% of my colleagues don't have any influence. Can you believe the cognitive dissonance that this, I mean, it is remarkable. I'm, it's, 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 it's hilarious, but it's also quite serious and I think very uh, disturbing to realize how uh, we perceive ourselves relative to what we think is the proper behavior of other people. So it's, a, it's, it's quite, a, quite an astonishing uh, finding in my view. Well, another rationalization is that, well, everybody's doing it. I mean, I'm not going to be outlier. I'm going to help myself as well as others that are doing it too, as we just saw. Other business people, business people, get perks. Again, the notion that doctors are simply in business and are not behaving any differently than other business people who also get perks from industry that uh, supports them. The industry overall has contributed enormously to health outcomes. True. Related? I'm not sure. I mean, how one goes from that observation to a feeling that, well, I'm going to be nice to them because they've done a lot of good things for, for the public. Maybe that's the connection. And finally, the relationship between industry and doctors brings such great benefits that conflicts of interest are a small price to pay. Again, another very interesting thing. I don't have a slide for this, but I just also maybe have seen this article about a year ago in academic medicine where... Uh, the, the investigators looked at, at uh, groups of residents from family medicine and from pediatrics, and they did a very interesting thing. They divided these residents into three groups. This was in a, this is a laboratory study, not a not a, a, a real life uh, observation. But they uh, they sh in the control group they simply asked them whether uh, they thought that uh, uh, it was okay to accept gifts from industry. In one group, they they gave them a uh, a survey of the kind of work hours and, and things that they were experiencing in their day-to-day -day activities at residence, bringing out some negative experiences that they were having. And in the third group, they gave them a rationalization that is to say, well, because you've worked so hard, you've gone through such difficult times, don't you think you deserve to have some benefits from the pharmaceutical industry in return? Well, the control group almost, I think, was like 16 percent thought it was okay to accept gifts. The group that just was reminded of how hard they worked was about 28 or 29 percent. The group that had a rationalization offered to them, 60 percent then said it was okay to accept gifts. 
So this was, a, this was just a sort of a paper exercise, but it, again, illustrates how, how malleable or how flexible or, or flimsy, <laughs> maybe, uh, is our ability to hold on to some of these uh, 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 value concepts. Well, in any event, again, a quote from, from Howard Brody. I'm not sure which is more severe condemnation of our professionalism, our willingness to be bought or our willingness to rationalize and deny in order to make it seem as if we're not being bought. In any event, if there is a part of medicine that ought to be as free from industry influence as possible, it is our own education. And again, I would subscribe entirely to that view. Well, let me move now to uh, the way in which industry interacts uh, with organizations like this. And again, I, I, I really don't know what the circumstance is here at the University of Chicago, uh, and I may be bringing all this information uh, to Newcastle, but in any event, you should be knowing what's going on elsewhere in any event. Well, does industry, how does industry support medical education in uh, academic medical centers? Well, they give gifts and free meals. I assume the lunch I ate here before you all came was not provided by industry. Okay, so I'm still clean. <laughs> Good. Well, but in many cases, you, as you know, uh, they are. Payment for invited speakers to grand rounds or other kinds of presentations is a common activity. A reimbursement for travel expenses to meetings, both for faculty as well as for uh, students and residents. Uh, payment for attending lectures and conferences and online presentations. Again, something relatively new in the world that that when doctors sign up for uh, online ac uh, educational activities, there's often a, uh, a reward for that uh, activity, a payment. Payment for faculty to uh, participate in industry speakers bureaus. Speakers bureaus, by the way, if you don't know, are, I think without exception, departments of the marketing divisions of pharmaceutical industry. So these speakers bureaus that are organized by the marketing division that, it, that entice uh, prominent faculty, sometimes medical school faculty, also practicing physicians in some cases, uh, to become speakers on behalf of the industry are done uh, under the guise of the promotional activities of the, of the industry. And consulting fees uh, for faculty that are, that are uh, uh, paid. Well, how prevalent is industry support of medical education in academic medical centers? Well, in terms of, of department shares, and uh, Eric Campbell in 2007 reported these data, that 80% of clinical departments uh, receive some form of industry support for their educational activities. Two-thirds uh, for CME, another more than a third for graduate medical education, food and beverages for uh, lunches and grand rounds and the like is very common, and travel support for meetings uh, was a uh, uh, acknowledged by 30% of these uh, respondents. In terms of residency programs, uh, uh, a survey of 381 internal medicine program directors with a 62% response rate yielded these data. 72% thought that industry support was undesirable. That's encouraging, right? 56% of them accepted <laughs> industry support. Again, another cognitive dissonance here that is hard to understand. The likelihood of support, by the way, Holly, you'll be interested in this, was inversely correlated with the program director's ABIM pass rate. So the more, I don't know what adjective to use here, uh, the more successful these programs were in preparing their residents for the boards, at least, the less likely they were to have uh, involvement with industry uh, support of their education. And what about medical students? Well, uh, over a thousand third-year medical students in eight schools uh, was surveyed, and 93% claimed that they were required to attend at least one industry-sponsored lunch. 86% had accepted at least one gift. 86% didn't know whether the school had a policy about these is issues. And 69% believed that gifts, of course, would not influence their practice. This is all well and good, but is it really a matter of concern? Well, I'm going to give you now my my take on this question, and this is followed. That if we tolerate commercial intrusion into what's our core mission, which is education in these industries, I think it sends a very powerful message to our learners about what, what we really value in these, in these matters. It also signals to the public that we are, in fact, for sale. I mean, this is, 
This is the message that, again, the taxi driver uh, understood quite readily. It also questions whether we really do place patients' interests uppermost. I mean, this is the core value of professionalism, is to place patients' interests ahead of all other things. And the fact that we are willing to allow ourselves to be influenced in ways that are not necessarily evidence-based, I think does uh, at least suggest that we are not entirely committed to that, to that value. And it does belie our commitment to evidence-based information. It undermines the teaching of cost-effective uh, prescribing. It also, I think, impedes adoption of more effective educational methodologies. If it's easy to get money to support sort of the traditional ways of doing things, it's, it, it somehow stifles the motivation to think about how we can do things better with the limited resources that we have. And finally, and, and in my view perhaps most importantly, I think this kind of behavior validates a sense of entitlement on the part of our learners. And I think it's one thing about the profession that I think is most worrisome to me anyway is this sense of entitlement that somehow because we're doctors, because we've gone through this arduous education and training, we're somehow entitled to special privilege. We are entitled to special privileges as part of our, our contract with society. We are entitled to set our own rules and regulations. We're entitled to uh, set our own research agenda. We're entitled uh, to a, a lot of autonomy, and even though that may be not as much as it once was, it still is an enormous privilege to be as autonomous as we are in the way we deal with our professional activities. But it doesn't make us entitled to special treatment on the part of the industry that is gaining advantage, financial advantage, from the activities that, that we engage in. So this sense of entitlement, I think, is a very uh, important thing to think about and how we can ensure that our learners in particular are coming out of our training environments uh, without a sense that they are entitled to some special privileges in this regard. Uh, well, the Institute of Medicine as a Profession, which is uh, uh, the, one of the Soros activities, David Rothman, you may know his name, has done a lot of work in this area. They did a survey of residents uh, in connection with a piece of work I'll show you in a minute uh, to sort of get what residents' uh, comments were, uh, kind of an anecdotal way. But here was a representative uh, comment about this issue. I think they are very smart in the way they train reps. A lot of ways residents are not respected. We have, a, we have terrible hours. This was before the duty hour thing, by the way. <laughs> we have terrible hours. We like, we're like the bottom of the totem pole, and they are so courteous. They make you feel important and that you're the doctor, and they have all this stuff they want to tell you and give you and respect you. But I think it does feel good. And so in some ways it's nice that they are waiting for you and they show up at conferences and such. <laughs> it must have an impact psychologically. So there's an introspective resident who I think put his finger on it. Another comment. These things definitely can change your prescribing patterns. There are hundreds of birth control options that you can prescribe but orth, orth jumps right out because they buy my textbooks every year and they give me a ton of samples. Well, let me introduce now an important caveat, and I, I hope I haven't uh, suggested otherwise here. I want to make it clear that, that gifts clearly have a potential for uh, influencing physician behavior, but that is not, in my view, a reason to demonize the industry. In our capitalist society, for-profit activities like the pharmaceutical industry have an obligation to serve their shareholders' interests. That's what they are primarily committed to do. Marketing drugs and devices directly to physicians is a sound and legal activity. If you or I were in their position, we would be motivated to do precisely the same thing. This is Physicians are the ones that are the final common pathway to prescribing and to ensuring that these products and services are profitable. So, of course, we would try to influence those individuals to do the things that are in keeping with our uh, bottom line. So it's the onus is on us. The onus is on the profession to protect the public's interest by safeguarding ourselves with proper kinds of guidance. Uh, so I think, again, we, we can, com can complain about what the industry does, but I think we have to remember that what they're doing is absolutely in keeping with what their obligations are. It's what we're doing that I think needs to be scrutinized and we need to take 
uh, some stock of. So in that context, there have been three recent uh, guidelines for academic medical centers uh, uh, to consider in terms of how they are going to safeguard themselves and their faculty and their learners uh, in, in these settings. The first comes from this study that I alluded to before, which was a, a joint effort of the ABIM Foundation and the uh, Institute for Medicine as a Profession, which is the, the Soros organization that David Rothman runs. Uh, they came up with this uh, set of uh, uh, guidelines in this article uh, from, from uh, 2006. Uh, uh, another uh, 2008 uh, uh, set of guidelines that was provided by the AAMC and in the industry funding of medical education, a report of a task force uh, that was actually co-chaired by uh, uh, Roy, Roy Vagelos, uh, was one of the co-chairs, the former uh, CEO of, of Merck. And uh, more recently, in 2009, uh, Bernie Lowe uh, chaired a, a group that came up with this uh, report, Conflicts of Interest in Medical Research, Education, and Practice. What was remarkable about these three largely independent, there was some overlap in membership, but largely independent uh, uh, reports was that they came to virtually identical recommendations across these multiple areas of potential uh, influence. Prohibiting all gifts of any size, including free meals, all of them came up with that recommendation. No direct support for, M for doctors' travel to meetings. Not, in not permitting manufacturers to provide support from CME, even through these subsidiary organizations. Uh, eliminate direct provision of drug samples. Uh, a couple of these recommendations acknowledge that pooling samples in some central repository that could then be distributed by the institution, if there were uh, guidelines uh, for that, uh, would be permitted, but not direct involvement of the industry in those sampling activities. Excuse me, prohibiting no strings attached faculty grants, that is grants that, that didn't have a clear deliverable as a part of it with transparency and a fair market value for those services uh, was something that was uh, uh, targeted. Consulting arrangements uh, and research, uh, again, that must be transparent uh, in its nature. No physicians with financial ties to drug companies could uh, be on formulary committees that make decisions about what drugs are, in fact, available to be prescribed in the institution. Ghost writing by industry seems a no-brainer. Why that needed to have to be even called out, I think, is a, is a question. But nevertheless, uh, all of them prohibited that or suggested that be prohibited. Whether or not industry should participate in speakers' bureaus was uh, the, uh, the, the JAMA article that uh, came down hard on that issue. The AAMC and the IOM were a little equivocal on that matter, which uh, I think raises some questions. But in any event, all recognized that there was some issue here about having faculty who are primarily responsible for educating the next generation of uh, healthcare providers to also be shills for the uh, uh, pharmaceutical and, and, and device industries, and limiting access uh, of drug reps to uh, non-patient areas and only by appointment uh, was singled out by the AAMC and by the IOM. So these are um, um, a set of pretty clear recommendations from some pretty well-respected, prominent national organizations. The question is, what's happened? Has there been any uptake of these uh, uh, recommendations uh, by academic medical centers? Well, again, the, the uh, uh, Susan Shimonas, who's uh, one of David Rothman's uh, colleagues at the uh, Institute for Medicine as a Profession, published an article earlier this month in Academic Medicine, which was the result of surveys of of all major academic medical centers. They got responses from 77 uh, academic medical centers trying to calibrate the strength of the, of the, of the uh, institutional uh, guidelines or policies that are, are in place that, that uh, uh, govern these various levels of activities. They went through an exhaustive process of trying to, to weigh each of the guidelines against this uh, uh, 10 or 11 uh, areas of, of interest and trying to come up with some assessment of, of the strength, the robustness of their guidelines. And then in the aggregate, they developed a, uh, uh, a policy strength index that is shown uh, on this slide. I have to take a pause and tell you about this slide. I came across this, or I had clipped this article out. It was published, I think, in, it was in, in, earlier in this year. I clipped it, and I put it in my file, and I forgot about it. And preparing these remarks, I said, oh, that's a very interesting slide. I didn't have time to make a slide of it. 
So it won't impress the back row here, you kids, but I took my iPhone, oh, no. and I took a picture. No. <laughs> I took a picture of the thing in the paper, emailed it to myself, put it in the PowerPoint presentation. Look at this. Oh. Are you impressed? Come yes. on. All right. <laughs> so anyway, this, th these are the data. Uh, this is the policy strength average along these 77 academic medical centers against these, again, I think it was, it was uh, 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 11 or, or t t 10 or 11 different items that they, that they evaluated. And here's the array of institutions along the, what they regarded as how strong their policy was. You can see 17 of the 77 had no policy whatsoever. And the strength of the remaining policies was really quite variable. I don't know. I tried to find out where the University of Chicago was on this slide. Do you know? Anybody know? I don't know. Well, we can tell you. Yeah. Gave us a B. We have a yeah, B. You had a B from, from AMSA? But we're updating it for this one. You're updating it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have identifiers for any of these places. I don't know. But I think what, is, what to me is remarkable is, is how bad it is. Not how good it is, okay? We have still, I think, uh, uh, have to look at those with some curiosity. So here's my final thought. The relationship between academic medical centers and industry, without question, serves extraordinarily important public purposes. Let's not forget that, that I think our ability to interact with industry in terms of translation research, in terms of doing things that are, that are, that are clearly important in terms of translating discovery into useful products and services, I think, is an absolutely strong public purpose that we need to respect and support it in every way that we can. But those relationships must remain principled. They must protect the integrity of medical education, for sure, as well as clinical research and clinical decision making. And they must be capable of withstanding intense public scrutiny if we're going to maintain the trust that we need to have with our public in terms of its support for all of our activities, we've got to pay attention, it seems to me, to, uh, to these issues. So, in final, we still have, I believe, a long way to go to put the genie back in the bottle. I think we're getting there slowly, but the genie's been out for a long time and it's been feasting on the kind of uh, opportunities that we've made available to it, and it's going to be hard, I think, to get us back to where we need to be. So, with that... I'll open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. It's Thank great you, to see you again. Um, I was uh, really struck by your last few slides about medical school policy, um, because in some of our work here with uh, Dr. Humphrey and others, when that started when I was a resident. And I assure you, things have improved since then. Um, we uh, we sh we showed that medical students who ca residents who came from medical schools that had stronger policies actually espoused much stricter beliefs and held themselves more accountable than med than That's residents who came from medical schools that had less uh, you know, stringent policies. On? Can you can you hear? No, that's it's only for the report. Okay, ah, so I'll, I'll speak up a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so in thinking about how the, um, the importance of uh, medical school policy, um, we, I was just curious what you thought about the whole initiative for, by AMSA to do the scorecard, because yeah. um, I think in, um, in being on our committee that updates our, our uh, response to the scorecard, and for those of you that don't know, you can publicly look, go online and AMSA grades every medical school according to their policies, and we are a B, as Holly mentioned, um, uh, but we were always a B, so we were the, we nev never had an F, which I'm proud of, <laughs> um, and when we, in our first go around, when we had a B, it was actually lauded as um, Pritzker got a B while other famous schools as elsewhere got Fs. Um, and so one of the reasons I think we have a B is, um, is our disclosure policy. And uh, we don't enforce, we enforce disclosures more for research, but not on an annual basis for every faculty. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that was sort of interesting is as we've started affiliating with a lot of other community centers, which I know is something you're interested in, right. we then absorb the risk of those um, faculty policies there right. and then have to meet and revise those. So that's been sort of something we've been undertaking 
Um, but I feel there has been a sea change, at least with people moving their policy. And so I was wondering what, um, you know, if you've seen it or what, what thoughts that you've had on that, you know? Well, well first of all, thank you very much for those comments. I don't need this. No, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, they're, they're encouraging it. And I, I, I share your, your, I think it was optimism that you were expressing. Cautious, and I'll, <laughs> cautious optimism. Uh, I do think there has, first of all, there's talking about this now. There hadn't been any discussions of these matters a decade ago, at least as far as I know, could remember. So the fact that we're actually talking about it and bringing some of these issues to the surface, I think, has got to have a, a, a useful uh, impact on, on, on further development of these issues. And I think the evidence is that, that schools are, in fact, adopting more stringent policies. How they are being applied, I think, is, is, is harder to, to really assess. And I know that there are some policies that look pretty good on paper, but, but uh, at least individuals in those schools are not necessarily compliant. Uh, but again, having said that, I, I, I do think we have come quite a ways from, from where we were. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, again, recognizing how long we've had this experience in, this, in our profession in terms of, of having such an easy access to these sizable perks, money in, most importantly, uh, has, I think, inert us to, the, to, to what it really means. And, and, and it's also made it difficult to wean ourselves away from it. Where else can you find those kind of resources to support CME or to support uh, residents' uh, educational activities and, and, and the like? Uh, medical schools and academic medical centers are increasingly under financial pressures. It's very difficult to find uh, flexible dollars to support these things. So, so I think there are some real barriers that, that we have to recognize, and they are, at least in part, a product of the, of the long standing traditional relationships that we've had and, and, and the habitual ways in which we have, and, and the, the sense of entitlement that I think we have uh, sort of perhaps unconsciously but nevertheless strongly uh, 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 adopted as a consequence of this history. So. The um, three major recent uh, papers that you cited that try to pr pr do some um, guidelines for how we should um, behave in medical education with um, industry, those um, are very silent on the issue of leadership of academic medical centers and individual specific roles. So my specific question is, is it appropriate for leaders in academic medical centers to serve on the boards of directors in a way in which they get compensated often uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year in salary, um, or is that a perceived conflict of interest? Because um, the work that's been done seems to focus on the trenches, those in private practice, um, those in the academic medical center, specifically that come in the form of teaching faculty and residents, and are silent on issues of deans, department chairs, division chiefs, who may well have been involved with the industry because of their research background and their research expertise and have helped bring a product to market, then those individuals get um, promoted to leadership positions. And in just looking at what's happened around the country, it seems to me the public has a, a feeling about that. In some cases, we've watched deans lose their jobs when they have served in a public institution that has taken a point of view. And in other cases, we watch, as recently as a few months ago, a new dean appointed um, on the East Coast, where the New York Times had a fair amount to say about that relationship. So I wonder if you have a perspective right. on that. Well, terrific question. I really share your angst about that. If I, if I were czar, <laughs> I would say, no, you can't serve on boards of, uh, of industries that have a direct financial stake in the kind of activities that your institution is involved with. I think it does, it, the, the, the optics of it are just so bad in my view in terms of the way the public, again, perceives that. Whether or not there's any real harm done, I think is, is not really the point in this case. It really is the perception, is the reality. Now having said that, I think there, and, and institutional conflicts of interest, as I say, are, are more complicated to try to sort through because they, they well, they just are. They're more complicated. They're, they're more layered. They're more uh, nuances about how those relationships evolve and, who's, and who actually is uh, uh, 
involved in, 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 in implementing them. Uh, there have been attempts to try to set out some guidance. Uh, the uh, AAU and the AAMC have developed some guidelines about institutional conflicts of interest that speak mostly to transparency. That is full disclosure. Again, back to the disclosure issue. Disclosure, I think, is a de minimis uh, requirement. It, uh, just simply because one discloses one's conflict doesn't necessarily free that individual or the audience that they're presenting to from any obligation to uh, uh, not be biased. So, but I do think that is an important uh, issue, particularly uh, in the areas that you point out. These leadership positions are visible, and I think to the extent that they are transparent about and, and fully disclose their interactions, that has, I do, do think, a, a, a somewhat clarifying uh, event. Now, whether proscription of those relationships uh, is something that will ever be uh, countenanced, I think, is, uh, is, is a question mark. I would prefer that myself. Thank you. <clears throat> John Ellis. I have a question about academic detailing. Mm. You said ah, that yeah. physicians don't want to pay. We're in an austere environment uh, uh, where institutions think they can't pay. Uh, is there a role for payors, government, to pay for academic detailing in the hopes that it leads to more cost-effective practice? Right, right. Are you all familiar with academic detailing is? This, this is where where uh, non-industry individuals, academics, are doing the detailing, bringing evidence to the physicians in practice about best practices and about evidence-based uh, uh, prescribing. I think that's a very, very healthy movement. And whether the government should be providing support for that activity, I think, is an interesting uh, possibility. I haven't really thought that through. I think I would prefer it being a professional obligation. I think the profession should be able to find the, the resources to ensure that these kind of educational activities are, in fact, evidence-based and what have you. Uh, and I think, the, at least as far as I know, the, the limited amount of academic detailing that's currently going on is non-governmental uh, support, unless I'm mistaken about that. Many people who have conflict of interest, they believe that they are honest. They truly believe that they are honest. And and so, for example, in our profession, neurosurgery, I, anyone I talk to them, they said, as you said, for science. Now, the companies develop certain screws or something for the back. Before publication, often they go different countries here, China, various, mm -hmm. well, talk about it. And most of these people already buy the equipment, $100,000 equipment. By, by the time, actually, you find out that it is not necessary, the company has sold millions of dollars. And the person has already gotten hundreds of thousand dollars um, in addition to travel for honorarium. <coughs> And so this is not a really recognized that somehow before the publication come out, people already know it. Some of my colleagues felt if they don't do it, actually be considered my practice. <laughs> so you would have today a disc surgery, which is simply you could take it out, somebody take a little disc out, you fuse from the front, you fuse from the back, and you get a lot of instrument. And, my, and then later on, you find out it was not necessary. So I am not so sure telling people don't do it or you know declare what you do is sufficient. It has to be a system in which the science has to be proven before it become propagated. Right. Well, I agree with that. First of all, the, on your first comment, the fact that, that I mean, is there anybody in the room who thinks they're dishonest? <laughs> is there anybody in the room who doesn't have a conflict of interest? No, we all have conflicts of interest. We're conflict. I mean, it's a complex world we live in. We have all kinds of competing interests that, that are not completely aligned. So it's not a question of eliminating conflicts of interest. I, I think we ought to get, get over the idea that we can actually, there are some conflicts that, about which we can proscribe and they cannot occur but there are a vast majority of them are not conflicts about which we can eliminate them. We simply have to manage them. We have to put them in priority order so we know what's more, more important and what can trump other interests that we have. And that's, that's, I think, the nature of what we're talking about here. And I think you pointed out an area about which I don't know very much, but which is clear 
needs to have individuals understand that they have an obligation as professionals to sub subjugate their self-interest in these $100,000 uh, 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 opportunities that they're provided by industry until there's evidence that this is really in the patient's interest. So. Well, I, I hope you'll join me in thanking Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.